Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your moderator, sportscaster at Showtime, Fox, and Westwood One Radio, Jim Gray. Not a good thing. Yeah. Thank you all. It's great to be here. First, let me thank Mike Milken for all the tremendous work that he is doing in science, finance. Hopefully, he'll find a cure to cancer, and we appreciate this conference, and I appreciate him having me as I have been here now. This is my 20th year. Wow. We got a great panel today, and we are very, very fortunate and really, really lucky to have assembled this group here today. Let's start with the man who's been in his position the longest, Gary Bettman, since 1993, has been the commissioner of the NHL. Next to me right here, Don Garber, second in tenure, now 18 years he has been the commissioner of the Major League Soccer, uh, MLS commissioner. Before that, he was 16 years with the National Football League. Next to me right here is Rob Manfred, took over for Bud Selig a couple of seasons ago. And on the end, Adam Silver, who has been with the NBA for 25 years and a few years ago, took over for David Stern. Welcome to you all. We thank you for joining us here today. Um, go ahead. They deserve it. I've known Adam the longest, so I'll start with you. Okay. Adam and Gary. Flipped a coin, Adam won. <laughs> Adam, I'm just wondering, you have so much power and are relied <laughs> upon by so many people. I'm wondering, who do you work for? Well, uh, I, I've already run into a lot of team owners, NBA <laughs> team owners here, so obviously I work for them. But in, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I work directly for the NBA owners. We have 30 owners. They act as, we call them our, our governors, but they operate the same way a board of directors would, and I, I serve at their will. But having said that, so they hired me and they could fire me. But I think they recognize that being a sports team owner is somewhat of a public trust, and that I wouldn't be doing my job in the way, in the best interest of, of, of the league if I didn't also represent the players and probably most importantly represent the fans. And I, I think in terms of the decisions we make a league, as, as a league ultimately, I mean, we're most focused on our customers and our fans and what's in their interest. And if we don't make decisions that are ultimately in the interest of the fans, we hear from them. So we work for the collective group of them, but I, I mean, of course I technically work for those owners, but I think that th this public trust notion is one that I find that our owners take very seriously in terms of their obligation to their communities. Gary, you've been at this a real long time, obviously longer but, than these guys here in your position. Um, how do you avoid the players thinking that you're in the owner's pocket, that you're only going to do what they want? I'm not sure I figured that out yet <laughs> since we've had three work stoppages <laughs> and missed an entire season since I've been doing this. Uh, Adam has it exactly right. While, while we work in terms of our retention and discharge for the owners, if you don't run the game, you don't run the business of the game well, uh, you won't be successful. And to run the game well, you have to be satisfying your fans. You have to be growing your fan base. You have to have a product that is compelling, exciting, and entertaining. You've got to be touching your fans and reaching them. Uh, and the same applies to your broadcast partners and your advertisers and sponsors and or licensees and all the people you do business with. So the success of the enterprise that will make your owners want to keep you on the job depends on you doing all of those things right and doing the right things. With, with the players, uh, in the final analysis, I hope... And in my heart, I believe that they understand that everything we do that I do is intended to be for the good of the game and ultimately for their benefit. I mean, to varying degrees, we all have different collective bargaining systems, but we have one uh, similar to the NBA's where we're sharing the growth of the game with the players. Uh, but when you're dealing with collective bargaining issues, you're dealing with uh, union leaders that can be very aggressive and very political, uh, Sometimes there's a fair amount of skepticism among the players as to whose side you're on. But in the final analysis, if you're not focused on the good of the game, none of it works. How often do you think of the fans, particularly when you have to make a tough decision on a suspension 
or something that you know is going to rile up the very people who are paying for your games, and, and, and it may be a borderline thing. So you're going to antagonize them regardless of whether it's right or wrong. Well, we try to pay very close attention, try to do research about what our fans think on all of the major issues facing the game. Um, having said that, there are situations in which um, you have to confront issues that you know a substantial number, maybe even a majority of your fans disagree with what you're going to do. And, you know, that, that, that's a business ju judgment. You, you have to pay attention to the fans, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, the fans don't run the game. Um, and you have to occasionally do things that may be unpopular um, for the good of the game over the long haul. Fans don't run the game, but, boy, if you don't have them, it's pretty hard to play. You know, it's no doubt, Jim, with us, you know, we're trying to build a, a soccer nation in our country, so you have so many different constituents within that. You know, we all answer to owners, and we answer to our fans and sponsors and, and media partners, but we also answer to the broader community. You know, we, our, our players live in the community. They, uh, they're taxpayers. We're working as hard as we can to get public financing for our stadiums, and it's all an ecosystem that works together that, if done right, creates all the value that can uh, reside with owners and can be delivered back uh, to the community. Uh, at the end of the day, I, we all think about this a lot. Uh, you, you don't report to your fans, but ultimately, if you're not mindful uh, to any consumer, then you're going to lose them. And that's what makes these jobs interesting and at times very challenging. We live in an era where things are changing so <coughs> rapidly, and, and now we're into the digital era. And Rob, you can get the highlights of any baseball game at your fingertips on a moment's notice. You guys can get the scores, the fans. Don't really have to watch the game to participate in the games anymore. How are you handling these challenges, and how do you maintain an interest in the actual physical game, not only at the stadium, where the experience may be better on television, but away from it? Um, well, How do you maintain your relationship with the fans when it's so readily accessible? Well, I think that um, we have a tremendous in-park experience. Um, I don't think you often hear people say that um, they'd rather watch baseball on TV than, than, than be in the park, and that's a tremendous asset for the game. Um, I, I do think that there is a challenge in the digital age, and it, while people are engaging with the game, um, you need to find mechanisms uh, that deepens that level of engagement. So they're watching a highlight. How can you take that person who's looking at a highlight on his phone and get him into the ballpark? I think the answer for us um, has been to work with technology, to try to enhance the technology around the game, to attract those same people who want to be on their phone into the ballpark. Um, a lot of the teams use a ballpark app that is really appealing to people, tells them things about the game that they wouldn't ordinarily know. And I think we need to continue to develop technology uh, to deepen the engagement and make sure that our fans are not just checking scores and watching highlights on their phone. Adam, you obviously have less seats than football and, and baseball, but you can see every replay. It's not $12 for a beer. You don't have to worry about traffic going into the game and parking. What are you guys doing now to make sure that that experience stays special and only isn't available for the wealthiest amongst us? Well, it, it's fascinating. I, I sat in meetings, I'm sure same for you, Rob, and the, and the other guys here a decade ago, where everyone was predicting that attendance would go down for our sport because of the availability availability of programming on television. I mean, people are of a certain age here. Remember, they used to black out our games right. if they weren't sold out. And then this, this so-called secondary marketing market came, which we used to call scalping, and people said, now why will people buy season tickets because they're readily available? And we just came off a regular season now where we had our highest attendance in the history of the league. And I think a large part of it is due to the incredible job that our teams do. And they responded to the marketplace and they created better experiences in our arenas. I mean, I think we do have an advantage. They're smaller than 
stadiums, but they have roofs. We're not weather dependent. Um, almost all of them have moved from the suburbs back into cities, so they're convenient. They're available based on um, public transportation. But they've created great entertainment experiences in our building, and part of that, they've made them more accessible. They've made them easier to get into despite security. Made, they made the seats nicer. They made the food better which is meaningful. They made the entertainment better during the breaks and during halftime. And we've really focused on um, pace of play issues as well. And, to, and then to your next point about the price of tickets, that's something that, that is always concerning to us. But I'm not sure I have an answer there because you may remember, Jim, that back about 15 years ago or so we, uh, under David, we instituted a policy where we required every team to sell $510, $510 tickets uh, in response to this issue that f certain fans were getting priced out. That's still the case? Well, no. So what happened then as a more robust secondary ticketing market came largely because of the internet and StubHub and all these sites, what people smartly did is the brokers would get those seats and they just flipped them. And, and what you learn is that if there's a market, you, you, I mean, that's what this whole conference is about, I guess, <laughs> in some ways, is markets, and that if the market price for a ticket is $100, and you force the team to sell it for $10, the people buy it for $10, and they resell them for $100. And so right now, even though, even, we, we were roughly 92% sold out this, this past season at the, at the price we were selling for, and even there, there's, there's many teams, despite how high the tickets are priced, especially in the, in the largest cities, where they could probably charge even more for their tickets, but politically, they're sensitive to increasing the prices even more. So I'd only say that, you know, a little bit of Rob's answer that I think technology actually has been extraordinarily helpful in delivering the game to more people through high-quality HD video, through smartphones, tablets, and everything else. And that is realistically, you know, especially when you think of us as a global business, 99.9% .9 of our fans are never going to step foot in an NBA arena. And there really are television studios, and we're creating a television experience for most of our fans. And that... And, and that ticket pricing is going to be a function of the marketplace. Gary, let me change the subject uh, and, and turn to concussions and head injuries, which is a big, big issue in professional sports, mainly in soccer, professional football, and, and also in hockey. Uh, last night, Sidney Crosby, who's had concussions before, hurt his status going forward, uh, not known now. Uh, but what can be done about these head injuries when you're playing sports at such quick, quick speeds? And, and, and quite frankly, they're violent collisions that occur on a lots of plays. The, uh, I would rather have answered the other question. Uh, Martin? This, <laughs> especially since we're subject to litigation now, but I'll be as careful and as direct as I can be. Uh, when you're playing a contact sport, there's always going to be the risk of injury. And what we have tried to do is understand the medicine, understand the science, and provide as safe an environment as possible uh, within the context of a physical sport. In our case, we're playing also in an enclosed area. And also, by the way, the guys are carrying sticks and physical contact is encouraged. So what we did going back as early as 1997 when the, the knowledge, the state of, of science and medicine was still in its infancy on concussions, we started, and we were the first sports league to do this, a working concussion study group uh, with our players, with our doctors, with our trainers to try and understand how we should be dealing with the issue of player safety and in particular concussions. So we were the first sports league to do baseline testing. We were the first sports league to have protocols for diagnosis and return to play decisions, which is something that people didn't have a handle on and I think they're still trying to figure out. We changed the rules, we softened the environment, we changed the equipment. We, have a, we were the first sports league, and I think maybe still the only, that has a department of player safety. Uh, and what we're trying to do is stay on top of all of the developments that are taking place from a medical standpoint in terms of how you deal with concussions. Uh, and it's something that's constantly evolving for us, uh, and I think all the sports leagues, because the science is still uh, in, in a nation state, and 
the doctors, the medical community is still a work in progress in getting a complete handle on it, but it's something that we're taking very seriously and we devote a tremendous amount of time and effort to. Don, it's a problem in soccer as well, uh, particularly women's soccer uh, growing up when they play, but it's, it's a big issue for you too. You know, it, it is, Jim, and it's an issue for all high contact sports. And I, I think we, you and I talked about this the other day. You know, it's not the two or three concussions that you get when you become a professional player. It's the head injury or head contact or concussions that you're getting as you're going through your development as a player and then becoming a professional. Uh, and we have the same testing programs that exist in the other leagues. We actually use the same doctor that Gary uh, recommended to us and, and have been working hard with the U.S. Soccer Federation on trying to come up with the right education because education kind of gets you halfway there and then your own protection and programs uh, and, and baseline testing and then protocols allow you to deal with it when it happens. Interestingly, in the soccer front on the youth side, Jim, we... Uh, the U.S. Soccer Federation, with the league's support, has, has uh, with our development academies, and they're all over America, have basically eliminated heading under 10 years old. So uh, boys and girl youth soccer players aren't allowed to head the ball, which seems like it makes sense from a grassroots perspective, but those 10-year-olds are going to grow up and be U14 and U18 players, eventually MLS players, and are going to be competing globally, and I can assure you that the players on the Brazilian national team are not uh, prevented to head the ball when they're under 10. And we're competing in a global market, both in World Cup competition, but also uh, for players and for, for media attention. So these are complicated issues. I think we've got to all be, remain very focused on it and uh, ensure that we're like protecting our fans, protecting the health and safety of our players. Not that either of you two would want to take advantage, but the NFL, and these folks have a huge problem going forward because huge problem. just like boxing many years ago, parents figured out, well, if my kid's going to get hit in the head, let him get hit in the head with a helmet on. Now they've figured out my kid's going to get hit in the head with a helmet, it's still going to be a problem, that they're still susceptible to these injuries. So might you now be able to attract all of the best athletes who are playing in football, soccer, possibly hockey, even though there might not be much of a mix now, and get all the best athletes, and what are you doing, or if you are doing, to recruit in that manner? Well, we are very focused on um, kids playing baseball, and we're focused on kids playing baseball for the simple reason that the single uh, most important determinant of whether somebody's a fan as an adult is whether they played as a kid. It's true of all sports, and as a result, um, you know, we have a very um, broad-based initiative that, that we operate under the umbrella called Play Ball, designed to get kids, kids in underserved areas playing our game. We think there are a lot of good reasons um, why kids should play baseball. It's a very safe game, and great values associated with our game. Are you selling it more that it's safe? Uh, can I tell you, we don't focus on the safety issue um, except as it relates to our sport. We, we, we've made a conscious decision that we don't draw comparisons to other sports. Um, it's very rare that, that I even talk about other sports publicly. We focus on the strength of our game and try to encourage kids to play what we regard to be the greatest game in the world. But isn't there an opening here, Adam? I mean, if you have a great wide receiver and he can shoot a basketball, the parents are going to say, shoot the ball. You know, I, 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 same answer Rob gave. We, we don't focus it on, on it in that way. I, I think we focus on the overall health of our players and the physical fitness aspect and the fact that girls play as well as boys. But we've been the number one participation sport in the country for a long time in, in terms of basketball. And actually, head injuries have been an issue historically in basketball as well. Players, boys and girls, to, to Don's point, at a young age, fall, hit their head when they're playing basketball. So, I mean, and I'm not say, suggesting you're saying this, but we far from celebrate head injuries in other sports. And in fact, um, Roger, Gary, um, Don and I have sat in panels, some that were hosted by um, federal agencies in terms of dealing with head injuries for kids, letting them know what they should do, how they should get help, and things like that. So I, we view that as a collective issue in sports. And, and, and also, we're very focused on kids being active. I think for, for all of us, we recognize that it's important for this next generation of kids, boys and girls, that they be physically active. I, I think 
obviously for their health, but also for our businesses. It, you know, Rob said it perfectly. The largest determinant of whether they're going to be a fan when they grow up is whether they play that sport as a kid. And generally, it's still the case that for in, in basketball, the great athletes play multi-sports. And in fact, you know, Gary mentioned something about the science of what we're seeing is that even in terms of injury prevention when they get older, what the, the doctors are telling them at a young age is don't specialize is play multi-sports, develop different muscles, develop overall coordination. We don't want um, boys and girls to be only playing basketball when they're 10. In fact, we recently made, you know, we made recommendations where th through, through a, a panel we put together that kids don't specialize till they're 14 years old and, and are only playing one sport. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for those sports to, to, to find solutions to dealing with head injuries. As I said, we're not immune from it. It's not as dramatic, but it happens in our sport as well. And, and in the NBA and the WNBA, we deal with concussions too. Isn't really the bigger issue that young people are going to play the sport that interests them and has a passion that they have a passion for? And frankly, those that are good enough, skilled enough to make it to the elite level, if you don't have a passion for what you're doing, and it's not going to be based on a calculated decision as to what the likelihood is that you're going to get injured, either your knees are going to go or you're going to get a concussion or you're going to get rotator cuff injuries, you're going to play the sport that you're excited about and that wants you, you know, that you want to get out and do every day because it's a passion for you because you can't make it to the elite level if it's not something that really is going to motivate you because you love it. I actually think Adam raises the, the more, um, an issue that it gets more focus from us in terms of kids, and that is the specialization in sport. Um, you know, John Smoltz gave a great speech when he was inducted in the Hall of Fame, and one of the principal themes uh, of that speech was that his parents encouraged him to play all three sports, you know, three different sports, three different seasons, and it's one of the reasons he was, became such a great player. And one of the things we are seeing in our sport is that we are drafting high school players that are actually damaged goods as a result of specialization in sport too early. Um, so it is an important um, health issue. For and, and our orthopedics are telling us the same thing, that they're now seeing when they have 19 and 20-year-olds, they're seeing wear and tear um, issues with their, with their joints that they used to see when they were in their late 20s. Because you now have, I mean, this is something, and... and it's a larger issue. It goes, it's off, off point a little bit from your question, but I know we're trying to address, and you see it with, with pitcher injuries, right. kids when they're young, and you have pitch count issues and everything. In basketball, now you have AAU programs where kids are playing eight games in a weekend, mm. and there's a absolutely no incentive, especially for the top kids. The last thing they do is raise their hand and say, my knee hurts or whatever else, because the stakes are so high to get into the right program and to get into the Nike camp or the Adidas camp or the Under Armour camp or whatever else. And so I think that's an area where historically we've stayed out of as a league. But I think when you look at you know, how we're going to develop the very best players when they get into their 20s, I think it's, it's, it's unavoidable that we pay more attention to how they're training when they're kids it, because it, these injuries are profound. I mean, and and, what, and it, it's having a direct impact on their ability to compete as adults. And that goes back to education, which we're all involved in, both at our level for our athletes uh, and with respect to what the the governing bodies at the youth level, the grassroots programs, are doing. There's more information about health and health issues now than ever before, and that's a good thing because we're in a position to set an example and disseminate it better than anybody else. I hate to be the politically incorrect one here. <laughs> you know, and we're probably the lone wolf on this, and it's part of the global market that we're uh, participating in. You know, our players, American players, that I'll just deal with the men for a second, uh, they're competing against players from around the world. And if we have a, a kid that's, and all of you are parents that probably had your kids playing soccer and at times they're playing too much, uh, but they're competing against players from every country around the world and if we're not giving them that opportunity to do that, at 15 they're going to leave and they're going to go play in Germany, they're going to play in Italy, we're going to lose the ability to turn that player into a hero that we could sign in Major League Soccer and then ultimately create that fan connection that we need. I think the key aspect of it is how do we ensure that those programs are keeping them healthy? And I hear a lot about specialization creating injuries. And I agree with baseball players when we talked about that, Rob, when you get a great pitcher for the Mets and by the time he's becoming a great pro, 
He's already thrown more pitches than he should have. But I don't think that you could have a cookie cutter for all sports. You know, all leagues are different, all sports are different, and we all have to manage the dynamics that we have to ensure that we have the best possible product for our fans while being socially responsible to, you know, the, the world that we're operating within and, and, and being good citizens. Adam, uh, I'm going to now go down the line and just ask you guys each individual questions basically about your sport, then we'll come back to some more general themes. This whole issue of resting players toward the end of the season took on a life of its own. And it's not just at the end of the season. <laughs> during the season, yes. All season. And, and, and the fans get to see these guys, particularly if you're a West Coast team coming East, you see them one time a year in, in the building. So the fans pay for season tickets or they pay a tremendous price. And then that guy, whoever it is, Steph, LeBron, decides, or the coach decides, or the management decides, he's not playing tonight. Well, it becomes a huge issue, and it also becomes a competitive imbalance, particularly at the end of the year when teams are trying to make playoffs. This guy's resting, this guy's not. Are they trying to figure out the seedings? What are they doing? You got a huge problem here on your hands, and, and it's really upsetting the fans. You addressed it to a certain degree, but what do you plan to do now going forward? Well, so I think there's, there's two separate issues. That, that's why I sort of was distinguishing between, call it the end of season resting, and then resting throughout the year. So that the... the the resting throughout the year relates directly to the prior subject we were discussing. And as Gary said, the science, the, the data around health has gotten so good now that our very sophisticated teams are looking at... And it's, it's something, by the way, that's, that's, that Don could speak to this has been always part of European soccer where players are strategically resting, rested because they play for their clubs, they play for their national teams, they play for their leagues, and they're just physically not able to play in every game. And so throughout the season, these are teams who desperately want to win, but are making determinations, you know, based on very sophisticated analytics that, you know, after this player playing for 28 games in a row, there's analysis that if they can sit out this game and then rest two more games, they're going to have a 24%, you know, less chance of being injured or whatever else. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to turn the clock back on that. And it's actually, you could argue that it's ultimately pro-consumer because if you can keep that player healthy by resting him one game, far more people are going to get the benefit of seeing that player play. And then when it gets to the playoffs, it's more likely that player will be healthy. And what's interesting when you, you look at the data, and, and you know, Jim, you, you said you and I have known each other for a long time, that in the not-so-old days of the NBA, when we had, for example, our deal with NBC and you, you were a reporter then, there were, very, there were many fewer so-called national games, marquee games, and those games were generally on weekends and they were on NBC. Mm -hmm. And teams would circle those games. And players would never rest in those games because they knew it was in the player's interest. They, they weren't otherwise seen by a national audience. Um, they understood the significance of those games. And um, your old boss, Dick Eversall, would have gone to their homes and <laughs> pulled, them, pulled them out and dragged them <laughs> over to the arena if they, if they didn't show up. And, and then what, then this is sort of all the great things that have happened because of technology, but now we're in an era where every game is in essence a national game, or a global game for that matter. You know, if you have League Pass on your phone, on your tablet or whatever, you can see every game. There's highlights, as you pointed out earlier, for every game. Every moment of every game is being scrutinized. What's interesting, if you go back in the data, and we've done this, the players are playing, If you especially look at our All-Stars, they play just about the same number of games today as they played 30 years ago. But 30 years ago, if they were being rested, they were never rested in those so-called marquee games. And there were hardly even national highlights if they sat out a, a, a division game that people weren't being, paying attention to. So now, move to today. I'm not saying it's not a huge issue. I think what, what's been magnified this year, now to the regular season issue, there were two instances where we have what our equivalent of a marquee package on Saturday nights on ABC where multiple starters were rested. And I think our response as a league has to be to our teams that, I mean, I'm hoping we don't get in a position where the league office, the commissioner, is directing to these great coaches how they should manage their players, when they should play, when they shouldn't, how many minutes they get. But I think we're, we're in the process of coming up with guidelines, call them, where, and I think our teams will cooperate. Well, they'll agree, even if there needs to be appropriate resting for the players, health-directed resting, that don't rest multiple starters for those important games. And I, and I think, and, and to your point also, in the NBA, and every league is different, where certain marquee players are only showing up in certain cities once, rest them at home. 
Exactly. And, and plan accordingly. And I've talked to many of them, the, the, the great GMs in this league that you know, and I've had that discussion with them where they can, you know, look at, at, at the analytics sort of over the course of the season and be more strategic and say, all right, it's, it's December 15th. You know, we have a game on January 18th that's at home. It's this, and that might be the appropriate place, and we won't rest all our players together. And, and just to address the other part of your question, then there's a separate issue around resting, and that is where players are rested at the end of the season. And I think that's the, a, a problem, but a different kind of problem. And everybody knows what's going on there, and that's where it's the players who are on the floor desperately want to win. But those players that are being rested, it has a lot to do with the way our draft works. It has to do with the draft lottery and, frankly, the significance and the importance of getting top draft picks. And I think we're going to have to address that, and we're going to have to find a way whether we once again... I mean, remember, the draft lottery that came in place in 1984, you know, was precisely because of that issue. It's not... I mean, Gary was very involved in it when he was at the NBA. That's not a new issue, that teams are strategically resting players in order to, 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 to try to get to the place they want to in the draft. I think there's a problem when the incentives aren't aligned. That's what we have right now, where there's... Because those top picks can be so valuable to our teams, the incentives aren't aligned. And I think we're going to have to find a way to address that aspect of resting. And finally on this, what about the fans? Should there be refunds? Should there be game checks taken from players when they decide to do this, when it's unannounced and they show up? Well, no, no, I, I would just say again, I mean, when in terms of the amount of the number of games that our top players are playing, there's been very little difference o over yeah, the last 30 years. So the, the answer, though. well, I'll just say directly, the answer is, the answer is, is no. I, I, I think that, yes, there should be appropriate notice if a player is not injured and, and he's resting because people are buying tickets at the last minute. But, you know, people go to Broadway shows and the understudy is performing <laughs> that night. I mean, there's a reason we have 15 players on the roster. And I, I, I mean that. And I think, you know, you're, look, LeBron James, just an interesting data point, LeBron James at 32 already has more minutes than Michael Jordan had when he retired at 40. I mean, and he stepped out for a little bit of baseball and he, and he briefly retired. But just by way of example, I mean, I, I also, I, and this is where you asked me who we work for before, I feel I need to be, need to defend our players here as well because players are, are not resting themselves. These are organizational decisions. It's not about our players saying, coach, please rest me. Players want minutes, they want to play. You know, they, they desperately want to be out on the floor. This is trainers, coaches, um, um, doctors making decisions that this strategic, strategic resting will prolong a player's career and put them in a better position to excel because this is based on wanting to win. That's why the end of the season resting is a very different issue. Rob, pace of play. You addressed it last year. It's still an issue this year. The NFL's grappling with it. They're doing away with some commercial time. Um, well, I How can you fix this? We live in such an age right now where everybody has the attention span of a gnat and, and everybody has ADD and they're looking at their phone. I mean, and you guys are going to have a three-hour something game. Well, you know, this is one of those interesting spots where, you know, we do listen to our fans um, and, you know, we try to make changes in the game that always respect the history and tradition of the game on the one hand. On the other hand, we try to listen to what fans are saying about the experience. Um, our fans, uh, I can say two things about them. Number one, uh, they are interested in less dead time in the game. You know, being against dead time is like being against cancer. There's nothing good against dead time. I mean, what, what, what is it? It's dead, right? I mean, you, you want to... Everybody's against that, and I think all sports are trying to make themselves as relevant as possible by eliminating um, dead time in their product um, and by going as far as, as taking a look at the commercial load during games. I mean, that, 20 years ago, no league would ever the, utter the words, maybe we need to look at how many commercials we have. But, you know, I think... Are that, you going to give back some of those rights fees? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're going to find ways to make sure that um, our rights holders get the value they paid for and that we still try to address the concern of our fans in terms of addressing dead time. The second thing we know from our fans is that they don't like too much change in baseball. Um, and um, so you have to find that sweet spot where you address one concern but don't get the wrong side of the line in terms of change. You know, I think this year, I mean, the single biggest thing we did was we eliminated the four pitches during an intentional walk. The last 1,000 intentional walks that were issued in baseball, one time something happened other than the 
batter going to first base. Based, based on the reaction in the press, the calls we get, the fan research we did, there are a lot of people who think that was a bad idea. I'm not able to can tell you exactly why, but they think it was a bad idea. And we pay attention to that, you know, because it's the fans that matter at the end of the day. So we're trying to find that sweet spot between not changing the game too much, yet making sure that we have the most compelling entertainment product possible. Don, the uh, next World Cup will go to Russia. After that, Qatar. Um, there has been massive corruption uh, involved in soccer, uh, match-fixing. Match uh, you had, obviously, the FIFA fiasco. Uh, and your sport's growing, and things are taking off. But now you're going to be hit for the next several years, not your league, but your sport, with all of these negative articles and all of these bad things that have gone on. How do you plan to combat that? How do you plan to sail your ship through these very heavy winds? Well, you know, all of the, the challenges that the sports had, by the way, have existed for generations, Jim. FIFA is an organization, it's almost like a quasi-state. It's got 209 countries as members. Uh, they're elected uh, folks, they're accountable to no one. We sort of joke around in saying that the president of FIFA, the guy who's no longer in the office, he got bounced out, Sepp Blatter, uh, the, when the Pope uh, wants to get tickets to the World Cup, he's got to call up the president of FIFA and get them. I was at a World Cup event and President Clinton was our guest in South Africa and the president travels with a detail and wanted to sit in the area where the, the royalty was and you know we had to get him a box and sit with some of our owners. So they operate in a world that's just very different than anything that, uh, that all of us as those that are sort of accountable uh, and follow the, the, the guidelines of just basic good business practices would understand. But that's been cleaned up. Uh, they basically have gotten rid of the president of FIFA, most of his staff. The attorney general, as you probably well know, is, uh, has cases against 40 uh, members of different federations and different confederations. I think the majority of them will go to jail. Many of them were based uh, in North America, the entire South American delegation, the president of every federation from Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, etc., all of them have been indicted uh, by the, uh, the U.S. Justice Department. So that process has forced a massive reform. I believe in that reform, and I believe that they're on the right path. Now, that doesn't uh, uh, really make us feel good about the fact that the World Cup will be in Qatar in 2022. Uh, a place that's got, you know, a couple hundred thousand residents was supposed to be in the summer. They forgot to tell everybody that it's 100 degrees in the summer. So then they decided to move it in the winter in the middle of everybody's seasons. Uh, so we have a breather, if you will, for a World Cup that I don't think will be all that great. But as you know, we're bidding for the World Cup in 2026. We've aligned with Mexico and Canada. We'll have an, an interesting NAFTA bid, if you will, that's very supported <laughs> Uh, by the White House, the President has come out, as has the State Department, in support of our partnership with, uh, with Mexico in particular, and we'll be able to show the world what an unbelievably uh, powerful and valuable and successful and passionate audience we have here for our sport and deliver the most, uh, I think, the highest level, highest quality World Cup in the history of the game. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to have continued challenges. There was somebody in South America who was just indicted by the U.S. just last week. Uh, it's called to question some of the things that went on in Qatar. Uh, so we have to recognize, like many of the other international sporting bodies, that we operate in an area where, you know, U.S. law trumps all of it. And thank goodness for our justice system. Uh, but it has its challenges, for sure. Gary, a lot of people were disappointed that there'll be no more NHL players in the Olympics in 2018. Um, it's kind of recognized, I think, by most sports fans in this country as an international competition. We had the dream team you were a part of back in 1992. NHL players came on much later, but there's an expectation level that this has been something that has been good, and now you guys have withdrawn. Uh, what's been the reaction? Well, I think the expectation's not well-founded, but I'd rather start and run down the line. Uh, NHL players are known for not resting and playing hurt. Ooh. We don't have a pace of play problem, and we're not subject, which goes to the question you just asked, to the jurisdiction of the International Ice Hockey Federation. 
And so we went to the Olympics for the first time in 98 in Nagano, Japan. Uh, we've been to five Olympics. It is terribly disruptive to our season. Uh, when you're playing in Vancouver or Salt Lake City and you're getting coverage in prime time as we know it in North America, that's one thing. But when you're halfway around the world and you're giving up basically three weeks of exposure uh, to play games at 7.30 in the morning, noon, or 2.30 in the morning, uh, there's a real question as to what the value is of us going to be in the Olympics where we get no recognition. We're not allowed to promote the fact that we're there. We can't use any of the video. We can't uh, use, the uh, use the marks. Thank you. And we started going in 98, and it was my idea, having come from the NBA, that it might be good for us. Uh, that was in an era before we had a network the NHL network. It was before we had a websites and all the clubs had websites. So we're out of business basically for three weeks. Worse than that though is what it does to our season in addition to the fact that there's a loss of momentum. Whoever, whoever is playing well into the break may not be playing well when they come back. Uh, our players come from 19 different countries. So some of our NHL teams will send 10 players to the Olympics and some will send one or two. And when we come back from the break, some of our teams will be tired and banged up, and others will be well rested from two and a half weeks on the beach. So it absolutely affects the competitiveness of our season. But even beyond that, it then forces us to compress our regular season schedule. So the risk of injury and wear and tear isn't just on the 150 Olympians that go, it's on all of the players who play. Couple this with the fact that it probably costs somewhere between 15 and 20 million dollars for our players to go to the Olympics. Because we're time pressed, we've got to charter them in and out uh, for wherever they're going from all our different locations. We have insurance because we lend the IIHF when we've gone to the Olympics somewhere around three and a half billion dollars worth of player contracts. And the players have been provided with accommodations for their guests and family to go. Uh, for the last five Olympics, the, some combination of the local organizing committee, the International Ice Hockey Federation, and the IOC have paid those expenses. And about two years ago, uh, IOC President Bach said, we're not going to pay anymore. I think it's in part because Adam probably asked for some money for the NBA players to go in the summer, which is okay. Um, and, and, what happened was, and what happened was, I had a lot of teams who said, you know what, this has been a hardship on us. It's been terribly disruptive. And if it's not worth it to the IOC to continue paying the expenses, why are we disrupting our season? Uh, I've had a variety, and we're not negotiating because the clubs don't want to go. It's terribly disruptive. But I've suggested to the IOC that they move us to the summer. And by the way, uh, they say it's not in the charter because the charter for the Winter Olympics is everything in ice and snow. Although in 1920, the first time they had hockey in the Olympics, it was in France in the summer. Uh, we've said, well, why don't you make us a top sponsor so we can make, promote the fact that we're there. Oh, no, no, that's not possible. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, I think the IOC and the IIHF views, as perhaps you suggested, that the expectation is we should just disrupt our season as, and go. And I think after done, doing this five times... I didn't suggest, I didn't suggest No, no, no. I, uh, I asked I what the I, reaction was. The reaction is... Uh, <laughs> it's you think mixed. you feel strongly about it? By the way, the reaction is mixed. Uh, there are some people who who believe it's fun to go. You know, if, if you're from Canada and you've won the gold medal recently, you like it. And by the way, when, you, when Czech played Russia in 98 in the gold medal game, there was no interest in North America. So we get heavily dependent on the results of, of who's playing well. In the final analysis, it's a mixed bag. There are a lot of our fans, probably about 50-50, who think it's a terrible idea if we go and it's a good idea if we go. 50-50 probably in Canada. More in the US, fans think it's a better idea not to go. Uh, but I tell you, most importantly, the clubs think it's a terrible idea to go. You know, 
because what? Gary's the most senior. Yes. That rule about not talking about other sports, that doesn't apply to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, no, I was just trying to engage in a conversation since we were talking about I just, pace of play. You know? I, I'm just making an observation. There you go. <laughs> Quickly, as we're going to have about 15 minutes left, we'll get some quick questions. That, but to follow on this, the NBA still wants to participate with USA well, Basketball as the game has grown so great, I believe, because of the Dream Team. Well, so, of course, the Dream Team in USA Basketball is just about our U.S. players. And I think roughly in 1992, when professionals first participated, about 5% of the NBA players were born outside the United States. Now this season, where 25% of our players are from outside of the United States. And as we develop this increasingly in, into a global league, you can only imagine the, the impact, for example, Yao Ming has had on our business in China. And but for the fact that China competes in national competitions, in international competitions, whether that be our, our World Cup of basketball or the Olympics, they wouldn't be investing in training their young players. And so for us, um, we get a lot of benefit out of it. I think in addition to the exposure that we get in the summer, and again, we're not dealing with the issues that the NHL is dealing with. As Gary even not said, if, if they could move his hockey to the summer, that would solve a lot of his problems. But so we're not, the, 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 so we're not stopping our season. The fundamental issue for us, and it's, it's something that our teams talk about all the time, is the risk of injury to our players. Because as Gary said, I mean, it's, it's literally billions of dollars of contracts Paul that George. are being put out there. And, you know, and yes, Paul George was, in, it was injured. It was a little bit of a fluke injury. And it, it happened in practice and it happened in the United States. It didn't happen in the Olympics. But I think, you know, we, we, we look very closely at the data. And so far, there's been no increase in injuries in those players who participated in the summer. And in fact, the regimen for those guys who are competing on those teams and the, and the training and the NBA coaching and trainers involved. It's, it's been, and I credit to Jerry Colangelo and Coach K, who's been the coach of those teams for the last several cycles. I think our, most of our teams would acknowledge it's been very additive to those players in terms of their training in ter and, and, and their conditioning and them becoming, you know, better NBA players. But, you know, it's, it's something we continue to look at it every cycle, but it's continued on balance to be very positive for us. Could our you team. imagine going if it was in the winter? No. By the way, and I will say one thing about another, I was in China three weeks ago. What they have done, the NBA has done for basketball in China is nothing short of phenomenal. And they should be congratulated on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that other answer. <laughs> he's, feeling, he's feeling bad about the comments he made about everybody else. But Jim, on to, to Gary's point, you know, we're, we, we are a sport that's about club and country, right? So can you imagine the World Cup without professional players? Lionel Messi playing for Barcelona and not playing for Argentina. It disrupts our season. We actually get compensated when our players both appear for their national team, but also if they're injured. They get their salaries pay paid on, a, on a, a percentage basis if they're injured. I think there are ways to work these things out. The FIFA solved the Olympic issue for the men. It's an under-23 tournament, so it's basically youth players, so you could send your second teams, your third teams. This whole idea that we're bigger than ourselves and part of this broader community and all the impact that we could have just requires us at times to think differently about the world in which we're operating in. And we've just got to find ways to do deals to make it work. Although your subject, and this was the point I was making before, your subject to FIFA's jurisdiction, right? They, like, you don't have a choice. We are, Gary, but remember too that American law trumps all, fortunately for all of us, right? So FIFA can say, we won't certify you as a team, and then we can go to FIFA and say that you're jeopardizing and preventing us from an antitrust perspective from being able to compete. We've just never taken it to that level because we don't want to. This whole idea of the global football community is a positive one, but you're right. They have far more power on us than the IHL, the I IHL. IHL has on you, both for good and bad. I mean, there are ways that we benefit by it. The World Cup's obviously a powerful vehicle to promote the sport, helps our league, helps kids to be motivated and excited and to be inspired, but you got to be subject to at times, the, uh, the whims and the rules of others. Let's talk about something more fun like marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Goodell has come out and said, nope, he's not for changing the rules. Um, I know an awful lot of NFL <coughs> players, many of them who tell me they have to use marijuana um, because of the nature of the game. 
it's legal in some of the states where you guys are all participating with your leagues. Uh, what's your stance going forward on marijuana, particularly, you don't play in Washington, but you play in Colorado, uh, where something is legal in the state for recreational use and your players are prohibited. Plus, they may, they may need it for medicinal purposes as well. well it may help them it's, perform. It's a, it's a prohibited substance now under our collective bargaining agreement. So by agreement between the league and the union, the players are prohibited from smoking marijuana, um, and they are tested. And, and so we drug test for marijuana and performance enhancing drugs and other things. I would only say it, it has not been a pressing issue in the NBA. Yeah. I mean, we just went through a collective bargaining cycle, and it was not on the top of the list for anyone in terms of changing our existing rules. I would say I, it's, I'm not sort of religious about being anti uh, medicinal use for, uh, uh, you know, of marijuana. If, if, you know, the science were such that, you know, we we're at a point where it was doctor prescribed and people were saying it was better than some of the alternatives. And I think back to the earlier discussion about sort of where the science and medicine are going, I think people are now more aware than ever before about how damaging some of the very toxic painkillers can be on, on players' bodies. So I think I'm open-minded on it. I think if there was, you know, medical data that that was a, a, you know, a better drug than others for, for dealing with pain. But as I said, it just hasn't been a pressing issue in the league. Rob? Not a huge issue um, uh, for us. You know, I would point out the fact that something's legal doesn't necessarily suggest how it should be regulated in the workplace, right? I mean, alcohol is legal. We don't allow players to drink during games. So, you, you know, it's not uncommon for legal substances to be regulated. Um, marijuana is, under our collective bargaining agreement, a banned substance. We don't test for drugs of abuse um, at the big league level. So as a result, it's not been, you know, our, our drug testing is focused on performance-enhancing drugs, so it has not been a hot topic for us. On the topic of performance-enhancing drugs, um, have they gone away, or are the cheaters just better? Well, I, I don't think those are two alternatives, but the, the fact of the matter is, Performance enhancing drugs, anybody who runs a sport and tells you that performance enhancing drugs are gone from their sport doesn't know what's going on in their sport. Um, well, we seem to hear about it less. The, well, I think you hear about it less because the programs have improved so much. I was looking at the numbers um, last week for something else. We're going to do 26,000 drug tests um, in major and minor league baseball. We're going to do t almost 12,000 just at the big league level. You know, there's 750 players. Do the math. That's a lot of drug tests. Um, you know, we have an investigative capacity in baseball um, that is probably the best of any sports governing body because of the issues that we've had. And as a result, there, you know, the risk associated with use has increased for the players. Um, that doesn't mean that there is still not a temptation. It's a temptation that applies in baseball and in all other sports. And you have to remain, I believe, you have to remain constantly vigilant on this issue to prevent a recurrence because there are scientists, and I use that word purposely out there, purposefully out there that are trying to find a way to beat the programs that we have in place. Gary, uh we live in a time where there's a tremendous divide in this country, 50-50, um, or however you want to come up with the statistical. Uh, people are polarized. Sports, in many instances, has been able to bring communities and people together. Been national rally cries when, when America has done well in, in the Olympics and so forth. Everybody really rejoiced in the Cubs winning, even if you weren't a baseball fan. It brings people together, and now we have very actively, players involved in social media, uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, and kneeling for the national anthem, to go or not to go to the White House, um, half say you should, half say you shouldn't. The honor of just going to the White House seems to be lost in all of this now. I'm just wondering, what's your plan and your strategy going forward? Because everybody now is an individual CEO with their own opinion. And you may have a guy who steps out, but he's not speaking for his team or his league, but you may suffer the damage and the repercussions with those 50% of the fans who are buying your tickets who are unhappy. That's a great question. I believe that people root for sports teams, follow sports, because it's a communal activity. It may be one of the places where there's great unity within a community. 
that transcends political divides. Going to the White House or not, it's about respecting the institution. It's not what your politics are and who's in the White House. Uh, respecting the national anthem, I think we, I think it's great for our players to be involved in political and social causes, but I also think that's not why people come to games to see them. So I would encourage, and I do encourage our players to do it on their own time, but when they're showing up for work to go participate in a game that people are focused on, care about, pay a lot of money to, to attend, then it should be all about the game. And that block of time should be apolitical, and we can use our platforms to demonstrate diversity, inclusiveness, educating communities on good causes, whether or not it's health or the environment. But when the game is being played, it should be about the game, because that's what fans want. Don. You know, Jim, the, the power of what pro sports can do with the influence that its athletes could have in our communities is just massive. And I think we all work as leagues in our own respective ways to try to have from, from really the top down uh, get our teams and our players out doing positive things in the community. And whether it's diversity programs or environmental programs, we all are deeply, deeply focused on this. But, you know, our athletes are individuals today, and they have a point of view. Uh, we have an issue with, you know, players, when they score the few goals that are scored in soccer every game, they take off their jersey and they wave it around, and we were having issues with political statements, which we've had to uh, ban. We have bigger issues, frankly, with our fans in stadiums because at, at MLS games, you can bring in flags, you can bring in all sorts of large displays, and we were having issues with what those displays uh, were saying and being used for political messaging. And then you have a public building, and how do you deal with the issues of controlling speech of large groups of people? And is it three people, or is it five people, or is it a large supporter section where a thousand people can do something with a card stone. And these are issues that leagues have to evolve as society evolves and people communicating more directly, to your point, they're CEOs of their own brands and, and have a strong point of view. I think as an industry, we've done a good job. We're, we're focused on it. We're paying attention to it. But something's going to happen next week that we haven't prepared for. And you just got to get the right people in a room and have a good partnership with your players to be able to come up with a good solution. Since you're drinking, uh, Adam, <laughs> it's been pointed out today that, that you've been very courageous. Uh, we were in a meeting before, and somebody made that comment, and, and the room applauded uh, with what you have done and the stands that you have taken. How did you reach those decisions, and um, what made you come to those conclusions? Well, I, l let me just begin by saying I, the fans are sophisticated. And yes, of course, I agree with Gary and Don that you know, at the, the event itself, the fans' expectations is, is that the players are 100% focused on their performance in that game, in that match. I think outside of that, again, the, these players are real people who live in our society. They're multidimensional. They have points of view. And I think this notion, especially with social media, where they can connect directly to their, to their fans and, and to a broad range of consumers, that they're not going to express their point of view is just impossible. That's who they are. And I think in terms of the view that the league's made, the positions the league has taken, I just like to think we've done things that we view are in the best interest of the league um, and best interest of our communities. And I, I think there, there is a, you know, we could have a much longer discussion about this, but I think there's a difference between value-based decisions and politics. And I think that there are, there are things that are true and right that our league has come to stand for things that, I, that existed long before I was involved with this league, things like um, you know, equality, um, uh, diversity, inclusion, fundamental values like that that this league stands for. And so and we're going to continue to uphold those values. Rob? I, I think what Adam said, just said is really the point. There, there are certain values that are deeply embedded in the culture of all of our games, all of our sports. And um, I, I think it's important for the leagues to continue to make a statement in support of those values. Um, secondly, I, I, we've never tried to regulate our players' speech. Um, you know, that's up to them. Uh, it, it is sort of a fundamental right. I will say this about our players. I think they have demonstrated um, great prudence in terms of being respectful uh, of the game, 
uh, of the platform that the game provides them on the one hand and finding other avenues to express themselves when they feel necessary to do that. Really good judgment on their part. Well, we've had a lot of tough questions. We're going to wrap up with one that I'm curious about. And I got a great answer from Gary Bettman coming in here, which made me think that I'm going to do this in front of everybody. <laughs> what do you enjoy most about your job? I gave you the great answer, and you want me to go first? It's going to all be downhill from there. I, I, we, 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 you uh, want to go last? No, no, I'll go first. We, 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 are, we, we have what, what many consider to be the most iconic trophy in all of sports, the Stanley Cup. So the easy answer to say is presenting the Stanley Cup every year. But, but it's really more than that, because growing up being a sports fan, growing up being a hockey fan, and being on the ice at the moment that a championship is won and being that close to the players and seeing the emotion and looking in their eyes and understanding the elation, maybe I can't understand it, but I can see it, up close is an experience that very few people get to, to, to participate in or see that closely other than those who ultimately were part of the, the championship run. And to me, every year that's really special and never gets old. Don, what do you like? Well, you know, uh, for me, Jim, I, I, I came here 18 years ago. We had 10 teams. We're, we've got 23 now. We're about to go up to 28. And all of that is driven by these incredibly positive shifts that are going on in our country, demographic shifts, the globalization that's bringing somebody who lives in Brooklyn who has as much in common with somebody in St. Petersburg as they do with someone in St. Louis, the emergence of millennials who are making decisions on their own, playing soccer as kids and now being consumers, uh, a audience that's very, very focused on diversity and equality, and they were looking for something, and now they've got a soccer league here in our country that they can call their own that's developing players, that's creating jobs, and giving kids the opportunity to grow up and be a professional like a hockey player was. I played high school hockey and never could play in the NHL, or I played baseball and I'm not a baseball player. But there are soccer kids that now can grow up and play in one of the great American cities or play in Canada. And every now and again, after all the hassles you have running a league, it just is, gives me great joy to see that growth and to see what our country and what Canada's been able to deliver for our sport. Adam, your, your game brings a lot of joy to a lot of people. What do you enjoy most? Going to the games. I, and, and I've been going for a lot of years, and I don't remember a time when aesthetically the game looked so good and the skill level was so high. Rob? I, I agree with that. I think, you know, when you have this job, you have to always remember it's about the game. That's what it's about. Um, it starts there, it ends there. And, you know, for me, it's um, not just when you go to a major league park. Um, I, I love the idea of being out there and being involved in youth programs where you see kids play our game. And um, I, I think it's always important to come back to the game at the end of the day. Adam, Rob, Don, Gary. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to the Milken Institute.